Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to lecture number 57 of module 11. This is the second part of metabolic diversity. Okay, so in this uh, particular lecture, we are going to look at chemolithotrophy after having seen uh, phototrophy. So chemolithotrophy is a, a very large part of the metabolic diversity that we are going to be looking at. So I will first define assimilative and dissimilative metabolism. And then we will take a look at the Vinogradsky column, the sulfur cycle and phosphite oxidation which is also part of the sulfur cycle. So what is chemolithotrophy? Um, any organism needs two things. It needs ATP which is the chemical energy and it needs reducing power. So this has to be obtained by coupling certain oxidation reactions with other uh, reduction reaction. So the coupling of the electron donors and electron acceptors is how cell, um, how the organism derives its energy as well as reducing power. ED stands for electron donor. It can be inorganic rather than organic. You can have organic um, chemoheterotrophs or chemoorganotrophs or you can have chemoautotrophs as well. Then we have uh, ATP generation which is coupled to the oxidation of the electron donors. So as they are donating their electrons, they are being oxidized and that is the uh, source of energy for the organism. Reducing power from the electron donor itself can be utilized or by reverse electron transport reactions. We have seen an example of reverse electron transport reactions in the uh, photosynthetic case. What are the different sources of electron donors that are available? You can have any number of reduced sulfur compounds. Remember that sulfur can exist in several different oxidation states only sulfate is the most oxidized form. So below that you have thiosulfate, you have elemental sulfur, you have sulfide, all these are reduced sulfur compounds. Similarly, you have reduced nitrogen compounds, ferrous, hydrogen and ammonia. These are all reduced form of inorganic compounds. Any of them can serve as electron donors and in the process they will get oxidized. Let's define assimilative and dissimilative metabolism clearly over here. So assimilation is uh, when an inorganic compound like sulfate, nitrate or carbonate is reduced and it's utilized as a nutrient. Remember what I said about macronutrients and micronutrients. So sulfate, nitrate, carbonate, these are macronutrients. They have to be reduced, turned into organic carbon, uh, organic uh, biomass and that's why they are macronutrients. Their uptake is limited to the cellular requirement. So if you were to do an elemental analysis of the cell, you would find that the cell will utilize only what is required for its functions. The compound has to be converted to organic form. So whether it comes in organic form or in inorganic form, it goes into the cell and becomes an organic compound. And most organisms have to carry out assimilative metabolism. Whether they are microorganisms, whether they are bacteria or human beings or anything else, they all have to carry out assimilative metabolism. This is essential to all life forms. Then we come to dissimilative metabolism. So what is dissimilative metabolism? So that is inorganic compounds are not serving as nutrients. They are serving as electron acceptors along with electron donors. So as I said, the coupling of electron donors with electron acceptors is where you get a release of energy. And that is dissimilative 
metabolism and this uptake is no longer proportionate to the cell requirement it's re proportionate to the L energy requirement large amounts of the end products of these reactions are going to be reduced and excreted into the environment this is typically seen in prokaryotes or bacteria so just to let you know um, i've already explained a little bit about assimilative and dissimilative metabolism but we're going to go a little further down with that um, what you see here are two graphics one is the cell yield with different electron donors and oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor so before we go into assimilation and dissimilation i want to talk about the cell yield uh, remember what i said in previous topics that when you have different electron donors it can be organic compounds it can be inorganic compounds depending on the nature of the electron donor when you couple it with oxygen you get the highest possible energy yield so here the highest amount of free energy available is with hexadecane okay so that's a c16 molecule then you have a c6 molecule thiosulfate ammonia hydrogen and iron now as we go down from right to left you will find that the cell yield the number of cells per mole of substrate is going down so this is uh, it's basically considered to be a simple correlation between delta G values that can be derived by coupling different electron donors with oxygen as the electron acceptor and you get a direct correlation between the delta G values and the cell yield. On the left hand side are various examples of anaerobic respiration so starting with anoxic conditions at the top ending with oxic conditions at the bottom you can see you have fermentation reactions where the delta E0 is going to be the lowest so you have carbonate respiration homoacetogenic uh, bacteria which I will talk about a little bit later obligate anaerobes so that is where the cell yield is the poorest and the graphic on the right hand side is with oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor it has the highest energy yield for that combination of electron donor and acceptor all the others are going to be below that then you have sulfur respiration we've already seen examples of sulfur uh, uh, respiration and the dissimulation and assimilation of sulfur uh, some of them are facultative aerobes others are obligate anaerobes we've all taken a, we've seen a, um, examples of all of them then you have methanogenic bacteria which are completely obligate anaerobes you have sulfate respiration those are also obligate anaerobes then you have fermentative bacteria which can be facultative and uh, you also have nitrate respiration iron respiration and finally aerobic respiration now here is a table that summarizes many of these reactions and it gives you the delta G0 values for these uh, reactions. Other than the first one, in all other cases, oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. Remember what I said, you have to have a combination of electron donor with the electron acceptor and the two together when they come together, there has to be a negative delta G value for the organism to derive energy converted to ATP and therefore survive so here you have let's ignore the first one you have hydrogen plus oxygen in the second case sulfide sulfide plus protons and oxygen converting that to a more oxidized form which is elemental sulfur that is done by sulfur bacteria and you can see the number of uh, the delta G values are all negative which means there is sufficient energy for the cell to survive and um, elemental sulfur can be further oxidized to sulfate again that's done by sulfur bacteria you have ammonia which is being converted to nitrite and nitrate by nitrifying bacteria again these are autotrophic bacteria then you have ferrous iron being converted to ferric iron i've already said a little bit about that in the iron cycle so these are all examples of 
uh, the utilization of inorganic electron donors, their combination with oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. Now let's take a look at the first one. The first one is phosphite. Phosphite is rarely found in the environment because it gets easily converted in the, in the presence of air to phosphate. Now if phosphite bacteria are present and sulfate is also present in the environment, then sulfate is reduced to sulfide and phosphite is oxidized to phosphate. This is also an energy producing reaction and it's the only known example where phosphorus exists in, a, in an oxidation state different from phosphate. There's, there's only one example. So then we come to lithotrophs that uh, exist under oxygen conditions or aerobic conditions. I was talking about hydrogen oxidizing bacteria where hydrogen is the electron donor. Now this electron donor can be coupled with oxygen under aerobic conditions and if the source of carbon is carbon dioxide, it's being converted to organic carbon, then we have aerobic autotrophic bacteria. If on the other hand, the electron donor and acceptor are both inorganic and they are utilizing organic carbon as the source of carbon which is possible, then it's an aerobic heterotroph. So here you can have aerobic or facultative lithotrophs, anaerobic, mixotrophs. Um, they are capable of utilizing CO2 or organic compounds as the sole carbon source and they can use various electron acceptors, not just oxygen but also nitrate, sulfate, ferric iron and so on. So here we have examples of sulfur bacteria which I have already uh, explained in the previous slide. You can have hydrogen sulfide with oxygen going to sulfate. You can see the amount of energy released, elemental sulfur going to sulfate, slightly less energy is released. In this case, in all of these cases, oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor and it's being combined with different electron donors, sulfide, elemental sulfur or thiosulfate. In all cases, energy is released, the delta G values are negative and therefore the ox uh, organism can survive under aerobic conditions. Let's take a look at the Vinogradsky column and what it tells us. So Vinogradsky has contributed a, in a big way to uh, our understanding of environmental di uh, microbial diversity in the environment. And way back in the 1880s, uh, he was able to show that CO2 can be converted to organic carbon without photosynthesis, which even today seems like a radical idea because even in high school we are taught that CO2 can be converted to organic carbon only by the photosynthetic process. But here we will take a look at some of the reactions that can happen in the environment without photosynthesis. And he also showed that lithotrophic autotrophy by non-photosynthetic bacteria is possible. What are these bacteria? They are sulfur oxidizing bacteria as well as nitrifying bacteria. And we are all, those of us who are in civil engineering or environmental engineering, we are all familiar with the fact that ammonia in the wastewater is converted to nitrite and nitrate. So that those are nitrifying bacteria. So those are simple examples of non-photosynthetic bacteria. We also have colorless sulfur bacteria. They are the ones that are sulfur oxidizing bacteria that can grow in the presence of hydrogen sulfide. So Begiatoa is an example of that. H2S is the energy source and it is converted to sulfur and then sulfate. <coughs> we also see the microbial conversion of ammonia to nitrite and then nitrate by autotrophs. Classic uh, demonstration of metabolic diversity in the water sediment column is going to be uh, shown in the next slide. Uh, so what this was the reason why it's called the Vinogradsky. Let me show it to you. So this is a typical Vinogradsky column in both 
photographic as well as schematic form and I will go through the entire process of how you have various groups or various species that coexist in the water sediment column and are responsible for recycling sulfur through the aquatic system. So this was demonstrated by Vinogradsky. It's a classic demonstration of the metabolic diversity amongst bacteria. It shows the adaptation of bacterial species with very specific carbon and energy requirements and their ecological niche within the water sediment column. You have phototrophs, both photoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs. You have chemotrophs, both autotrophic as well as heterotrophic. All of them coexist in this entire column. And you can do it, you can do a demo in your own lab. You can take a long plastic bottle, fill it with sediment and water with all the essential nutrients and perhaps a little uh, surplus of sulfur and you may be able to recreate it in the lab. This is the way nature recycles nutrients like carbon, nitrogen and sulfur in the environment. So here we have an aerobic zone at the top. Remember it's in contact with the atmospheric air. So the top part of this column is aerobic. As you go deeper into the column, it becomes more and more anaerobic and at the bottom we consider it to be completely anaerobic. And I will show you each part of this column. So what is existing in the aerobic zone? The first thing that's going to obviously take care, uh, take over is chemoautotrophs. So the chemoautotrophs include cyanobacteria. These are our blue-green algae. They are responsible for oxygenic photosynthesis. So what you see directly with your eye anytime you go by a pond or a a puddle of water which has a green layer on it. These are all cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. Um, th they are responsible for oxygenic photosynthesis. You can also have sulfur oxidizing bacteria. How are these sulfur oxidizing bacteria going to thrive in the same environment? They are and they are responsible for anoxygenic photosynthesis. They are colorless bacteria so you can't see them visibly and they are capable of utilizing hydrogen sulfide as the energy source. And where is the hydrogen sulfide coming from? It's coming up, it's a gas, um, it comes upwards. So it's being generated at the bottom of the column, uh, whether it's a lake or a pond or any other place, you will find that it has a lot of dark sediment at the bottom and hydrogen sulfide is being generated at that in that sediment and because of its gaseous nature it will come to the top and these sulfur oxidizing bacteria are capable of utilizing it as their energy source. Then we have aerobic chemoheterotrophic bacteria. Now uh, aerobic chemoheterotrophic bacteria are capable of utilizing organic carbon and they will exist just like all the other bacteria in your activated uh, sludge process. They are all aerobic chemoheterotrophs, right? Then we have anaerobic. Then we have the lower layers of this column. In the lower layers of this column where oxygen is either completely gone or at very low levels, you can have several other species. So in the anaerobic zone, we have photoheterotrophs. Purple non-sulfur bacteria can exist. Light is the energy source and organic carbon is the carbon source. Then you also have photosynthetic purple and green sulfur bacteria. So you can see the colors. The normal bacteria at the top, these are aerobic photoheterotrophs. As you go further down, you get purple non-sulfur bacteria, purple sulfur bacteria. You can see the colors and the green sulfur bacteria. And as you go further down, you get completely black colored sediment because of the anaerobic nature of the material. So you have anaerobic photosynthetic pulp purple and green sulfur bacteria and oxygenic photosynthesis. Sulfur is deposited over here. You remember elemental sulfur will precipitate, it will get deposited. This elemental sulfur will be reduced further 
you get sulfur and sulf you get reduction of sulfate no you get reduction of elemental sulfur and sulfates by sulfur reducing bacteria and you get heterotrophic fermentation where sulfates are reduced to sulfides and these sulfides because they are in gaseous form will come upwards in the column so let's take a look at sulfate reduction in sulfate reduction sulfate is an electron acceptor it gets reduced and the major anion it's also a major anion in seawater uh, by itself sulfate reduction is not capable of providing energy okay um, it so to for the organism to derive energy using sulfate as the electron acceptor it has to be coupled with the appropriate electron donor so sulfur oxidation is energy yielding but the reverse reaction is not an energy yielding reaction you can refer to another table so if i were to show you this particular uh, set of reactions hydrogen sulfide to sulfate has a delta g that's negative it's a high number and it's a negative delta g so energy can be obtained but sulfate going to sulfide is going to be positive and therefore it's not an energy yielding reaction so it has to be coupled with the right electron donor and i'll show you i think i have examples later assimilative so now there is another thing that uh, i need to talk about and that is assimilative versus dissimilative sulfur or nitrogen uh, reduction oxidation all of that assimilative means where the element is taken up as an organic compound so assimilation into the organic biomass of the organism is what we call assimilative sulfate reduction and that is common in almost all organisms whether they are microorganisms or higher organisms this sulfate is converted to organic sulfur and you know that organic sulfur is present in at least two uh, amino acids yes cysteine and uh, methionine so these are the two amino acids that contain organic sulfur and then we have dissimilative sulfur reduction where sulfur reducing bacteria are the only ones that are uh, capable of utilizing sulfate and converting it to sulfide and that sulfide is excreted and that is what i showed you in the vinogradsky column okay so what we have here are some of the compounds that are involved in sulfate reduction as we know sulfate is going to be reduced to hydrogen sulfide now this is an eight electron transfer and it goes through a series of reactions before it is completed um, one of the major uh, compounds that is involved in this um, uh, reduction of sulfate is called APS and that is adenosine 5 phosphosulfate so if you look at ATP uh, two of the phosphates in ATP have been replaced by a single sulfate and that is what APS is that's adenosine 5-phosphosulfate now this adenosine 5-phosphosulfate is used to activate the sulfate molecule the two phosphates are released APS is formed two electrons are transferred to form sulfite and AMP um, adenosine monophosphate is released sulfite picks up six electrons and is converted through a series of reactions uh, mediated by sulfite reductase to form h2s or hydrogen sulfide now this h2s is excreted into the environment through the pathway of dissimilative sulfate reduction there is another possibility and that is assimilative sulfate reduction so in assimilative sulfate reduction sulfate again has to donate um, eight electrons and give them to hydrogen sulfide in this case uh, another um, compound is formed and that is phosphoadenosine 5 phosphosulfate so here you have our atp molecule it has already been um, 
formed as APS. So that is adenosine 5 phosphosulfate. Another phosphate is added at the C2 position to get phosphoadenosine 5 phosphosulfate. And that's PAPS for short. So PAPS. Okay. Now ATP is con being converted to ADP and a PAPS molecule is generated. The mediating enzyme is ATP kinase and when PAPS is converted to sulfite, PAP is released. The sulfate is converted to sulfite. It picks up six electrons and is then converted to hydrogen sulfide or organic sulfur compounds. So we know that organic sulfur compounds, especially in the amino acids, are cysteine and methionine. So these are examples of organic sulfur compound and they have been assimilated into the biomass of the bacteria or other organisms and that's why we call it assimilative sulfate reduction. Let's come to sulfate reduction. So like I said, sulfate reduction by itself does not yield any energy. It has to be combined with the right electron donor. Now, if it's an autotrophic organism, the right electron donor can be hydrogen and CO2 can be the carbon source. So in this case, hydrogen plus sulfate plus protons will give you sulfide plus water and the net delta G0 for this reaction is minus 152 kilojoules per electron equivalent and that is sufficient for the organism to survive. Heterotroph is for heterotrophic organisms they can use sulfate along with any organic compound. These organic compounds can be lactate, acetate, any number of compounds are possible. They will convert the organic compound to CO2, sulfide, well, sulfate will be converted to sulfide and that is what we see around us. When you think about wastewater, what happens? Uh, whether you have sulfide or sulfate, if you have sulfate, it's going to get converted to sulfide. So that's what is possible. So these are some of those examples. Then we have sulfur disproportionation. So sulfur disproportionation means it is somewhat similar to fermentation. If you remember what I said about fermentation, your starting compound, let's say, is glucose, it will get converted to methane and CO2. Now, it'll, we are assuming just for the electron balance, we will say that three, uh, for each molecule of glucose, you will get three molecules of methane and three molecules of CO2, just to maintain the electron balance. It's a very simplistic way of looking at things. Similarly here, at the reduced end of the sulfur oxidation states, you have sulfide. At the most oxidized end, you have sulfate. What is in between? We have thiosulfate and elemental sulfur that are in between. So either of them, thiosulfate, sulfite and sulfur, elemental sulfur can be disproportioned. So disproportioned means part of it will be oxidized and part of it will be reduced. So that is called disproportionation. It's similar to what we saw in fermentation. Then we come to sulfur bacteria. So here we have, I've already said a lot about sulfur bacteria, but these are different reduced forms of sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, elemental sulfur, thiosulfate, in combination with oxygen can convert it to more oxidized forms of sulfur. So sulfur bacteria are fairly common all around you. They can be both colorless or pigmented. They can be green or purple and uh, the electron donors can be sulfide like I've already said that. Products of the sulfur oxidation reactions are protons and the pH gets reduced. Alright, so I have already covered the sulfur cycle uh, or will be covering the sulfur cycle in the biogeochemical cycles. So here we have a schematic that explains the different forms of sulfur 
that are present in the environment. So what you see here are three major inorganic forms, so hydrogen sulfide, elemental sulfur and sulfate. These are the three major inorganic forms of sulfur and then you also have the organic form of sulfur. So SH stands for the sulfhydryl group and this represents the sulfur that is part of the biomass. Now you can see from the sulfur, this is a very very simple schematic that shows you how uh, sulfur changes its oxidation state through various processes. So um, let's start with hydrogen sulfide, uh, it gets converted to elemental sulfur by sulfide oxidation and then to sulfate by sulfur oxidation. Now this sulfate is going to uh, be taken up either hydrogen sulfide or sulfate or even elemental sulfur. We have seen some examples of that. They can be taken up as either nutrients or for energy uh, or as they can serve as energy sources. So if organic sulfur is being converted to these inorganic forms, we call it sulfur mineralization and it's also part of the dissimilatory sulfur reduction pathway. Now there are two pathways, dissimilatory and assimilatory sulfur reduction. So assimilatory means it becomes the inorganic forms are being converted to organic sulfur and they're becoming a part of the biomass of the organism and dissimilatory is when the inorganic forms are serving as either um, they're serving as energy sources and uh, other inorganic forms are being excreted into the environment. So we're going to go into some of these details. Now we also have another thing that um, another process that we have um, I think we have already covered it and that is phototrophic oxidation of the reduced forms of sulfur. So just like we have oxygenic photosynthesis where water is converted to oxygen in the same way we have an oxygenic photosynthesis where hydrogen sulfide can be converted to elemental sulfur as well as sulfate. So those are the phototrophic oxidation pathways. When these uh, inorganic forms are converted back to hydrogen sulfide that is called sulfur respiration. So you can see the number of different processes that are present in the environment which allow complete recycling of sulfur in the environment. Uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit more. I've also mentioned in previous topics that uh, certain cells uh, can create storage granules of the nutrient that is essential for energy generation. So for sulfur bacteria, they have storage granules either inside the cell or outside the cell. I also mentioned that phosphite oxidation is something that is coupled to sulfate reduction. So this is the same example. Phosphite under aerobic conditions is spontaneously oxidized to phosphate and um, because this spontaneous oxidation is a chemical reaction, it's unlikely that any aerobic phosphite oxidizers exist. Like I said, there is only one species that has been found that is capable of utilizing phosphite and, and sulfate and converting both of them to phosphate and sulfide. So this is a reaction that is mediated by strictly anaerobic bacteria and it also shows the metabolic diversity of sulfate reducing bacteria. I will stop at this point. Thank you.